So Douglas, my first question is, what is Source Fabric? Uh, Source Fabric is a nonprofit uh, organization devoted to providing technology support for independent media. Um, and this is both in developed and developing countries. And the kinds of support that we provide are in the development of tools to enable quality journalism, but also in the development or in the application of those tools in, uh, in newsrooms and in, with news organizations. So it's not just about developing the technology, but then it's about taking the technology and putting it to use uh, in cooperation with news organizations. I would like to ask you, what would be an example of a project you've, you've uh, made with Source Fabric that you're really um, proud of? Well, I mean, we've got projects going on all of, literally all over the planet. Um, one of the areas uh, that we've been working quite actively for the last, say, a uh, few years uh, is in working with media organizations in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia. Um, where uh, we've been, we're now powering 11 media organizations and their digital presence um, there. Um, in addition, uh, one of our, our more interesting implementations has been in Basel, Switzerland, where we have worked very closely with a news startup called Tageswoche, or the Daily Week. Um, that's my bad English translation, I mean German translation, but um, I like them a lot uh, because they're a very digital first organization. Um, as a matter of fact, they describe themselves as being a, a website that happens to put out a newspaper on Fridays. Right. And I very much like that approach. Um, and they've been wonderful to work with because uh, they've been very active in uh, providing us with the requirements for the technology and then we've actually gone through and and made the technology for them uh, which which they have very kindly uh, permitted to be shared with others as free and open source software and the open source part of things is very important for us because it enables us to to share the the work that we're doing with a lot of other organizations and that enables those organizations to get technology in a much more economical and effective way. All right. Um, you know, there has been so much talk about the uh, social media revolutions, as they've been called, and uh, there have been some um, people who said that what happened, for example, in the Middle East um, and in North Africa will probably never happen again as it happened in 2011. So the, um, yeah, we have an interview with uh, Mr. Morozov about that, who, who doesn't agree on the fact that the circumstances that led to the um, Arab Spring, for example, will never present themself in, themselves in the same way in any other, in any other country ever again. Also because there's a precedent now. Mm -hmm. So what do you think will be the evolution of this kind of mobilization? Will there be any influence on your work from what happened during these last few years? Wow. Um, there are several questions sort of rolled up into that one. Um, the first one is that I'm also kind of skeptical about technology's role in enabling uh, that those revolutions to happen. First and foremost, I think those revolutions happened because of a lot of brave people who were willing to put their lives on the line. Um, you don't get a revolution by clicking a like button, and you don't get a revolution by retweeting. And, you know, the to that extent, um, I am kind of skeptical about the use of, of that type of tool uh, for the purpose of a revolution. I think that uh, they're separate things, and you know the, the the role of social media in this in this area is to actually get word out to people, and you know what those people do with with the word once they get it is another question entirely. Um, with our with the kinds of organizations that we work with, 
Um, and we do work in a lot of very difficult uh, media environments. One of the things that we've seen is that unbiased, uh, accurate information and unbiased, accurate news reporting, especially things that aren't being covered elsewhere, is viral. It is extremely viral. Um, one very surprising uh, group of statistics uh, comes from Georgia, where with the clients that we've worked with, most of them um, are, are small independent media organizations that are covering news that is, is really ignored by the rest of the Georgian news media. But because of that, their news is getting shared massively. Uh, for example, one of the clients has 75% of all of its traffic being referred from Facebook, wow. um, which is massively viral. Another one is at about 66%. Um, and in those, in those environments, one of the things that we advised was don't bother uh, following the, the president to open up a tractor factory because that's going to be the news on state television. Uh, that's going to be the, the news that you hear you know, on, on typical state TV. The president opened a tractor factory today. And all of the, uh, uh, the, the sort of traditional media will follow that same line. The president opened a tractor factory today, but nobody cares about that. And this is one of the things that social media does allow in, in regards to new, uh, to new news media. It enables them to actually have a much better idea of what really is connecting with their readers. Because, as I like to say, human beings are tremendous filters of bullshit. And this enables, you know, this type of, of social media is something that is, uh, we can see immediately whether or not it's connecting with people because they share it. People don't share news items that make them look stupid. People don't share news items that make them look boring. They share items that have social currency. And that sharing of news um, is something that uh, uh, obviously you, know, you can use for sharing pictures of cats, but in <laughs> many places, in many places, you can use it also for sharing uh, really valuable information about what's going on in your world. And you know, this is something that I think is going to continue to develop. Um, and I think that uh, smart reporters and smart news organizations are starting to really pay attention to social media engagement as one of their key metrics for whether or not this isn't a, a story that's, that's really connecting with people. Um, you know, We've discussed in Italy, at least, with journalists, with writers, about what citizen journalism and local journalism actually is and how it will evolve. And some people are skeptical about the the future of citizen journalism because you know there's there are some people who say that mm, taking a picture or recording a video of what's going on and posting it on Twitter or Facebook doesn't make you a journalist. So you need to have that kind of insight and the capacity of making links and analyze situations and consequences, for example, of what's going on um, in order to you know, call yourself a journalist. It's another kind of work. What is happening now is citizen reporting rather than journalism. So what do you think about that? Uh, I don't have a degree from a journalism school. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, in my university, uh, we, none of us went, you know, we didn't have a journalism school. However, we won more awards than most of the universities that had big journalism schools. So I take a rather uh, disdainful view of that approach that you must have a diploma in order to practice journalism. Journalism is not brain surgery. Although, you know, I think that uh, most journalists would, would like you to believe that it's so. Um, this especially has, you know, has consequences for, uh, for coverage where someone just happens to take a cam phone picture that cap captures the event as it is happening. Um, you know, and this could be something, you know, something funny, something interesting, something truly newsworthy, like we saw, you know, with uh, uh, the protests in Iran. Um, you know, there are all kinds of things that happen, um, and if people are able to capture it, 
then why not? Why do they need a diploma? Why do they need a press card in order to practice journalism? Um, I think that both, you know, I think that it's a false argument, to be, to be honest. I think that uh, there's a place for all kinds of journalism. Um, and this, is, this includes citizen journalism. Of course, it includes balanced, thoughtful, uh, unbiased reporting, um, investigative reporting. Of course, you know, there is a wide spectrum of what we, uh, what we can define as journalism. I think it's all terrific. And you know, it all needs to be encouraged. I don't think that journalism needs to be an exclusive club of people who have you know, advanced degrees in how to write a lead. Um, I think that that is absurd. All right. So um, I was looking, I was taking a look at um, your speeches on, um, at the International Journalism Festival. So I was wondering, since one of them is about a, the future of live blogging, are we going towards multi-editorial desks? I would like to, I'd like to know what you think about that, a little bit of anticipation of what you're going to say. Sure. Um, one of the, you know, there are several interesting trends going on in uh, newsrooms today, right? And one of the big ones is that nobody has any money. <laughs> Right? right. Nobody has, you know, everybody is broke, and everybody is trying to come up with new and creative ways to extend their coverage. Well, one of the ways that, that uh, we've looked at uh, in conjunction with the people at the Global Editors Network is the idea of allowing for ad hoc communications or ad hoc collaborations uh, between news organizations. So uh, to use the, uh, the, the example of the Libyan conflict, Right. Let's say that one newspaper has a reporter in Benghazi, and another newspaper has a reporter in Tripoli, and a third newspaper has a reporter somewhere out in, you know, in the desert. Um, there is no reason why those three organizations cannot pool their resources and to, to bring them together to create shared coverage. We already do pool coverage for things like uh, the U.S. president. Um, you know, we don't have 80 people with cameras following President Obama around on, white, on, on the Air Force One. Instead, what they do is they assign one reporter with the camera, and then they share the coverage amongst themselves. Um, so pooled coverage in this way already has precedence. But what we've done technologically is to allow uh, the, the pooled coverage to actually extend to live blogging. And so this is something that we will be uh, discussing at the event, and it's also something that we'll be unveiling. Um, in one of the things that we've been working on recently is uh, the development of an open source live blogging system, um, one that actually has a lot more features than even the big commercial uh, live blogging platforms, um, but is available if you have the technical chops to use it and to install it. Um, then it's available as free and open source, so you're free to take it and free to use it. <coughs> Excuse me. Awesome. All right, so um, another question that I'd like to ask you is, what's, what will the future bring you and Source Fabric? The future? I love <laughs> talking about the future. That's very um, George Carlin-ish, actually. <laughs> no, I mean, Look, I'm the director of innovation at Source Fabric, and so I get to wear a white lab jacket and goggles and talk about the future <laughs> all the time. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we do see, though, is that news organizations need to make do with less. Their, you know, their, their budgets are being squeezed massively. And so one of the things that we're working on is trying to allow people to do more with less. Um, by sharing resources, by sharing uh, especially technology, um, but also sharing know-how. Um, so for, for us, this, this need uh, has led to a lot of invention in the area of technology. And so the future will definitely uh, work in these areas, but we're, you know, right now we're working on a couple of really nice things. One of them is uh, the development of our next generation content framework. That's a thing called Superdesk, um, which is a 
uh, both a framework for building news apps, but it's also a few of these news apps that we've built ourselves. And so, uh, you know, the live blogging that we're working on is part of that whole Superdesk framework. And so uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that uh, in Perugia, um, but we're also uh, working on building a lot of these things right now. As a matter of fact, right next door, uh, we have a whole development team that's in a very uh, interesting discussion right now about, uh, about a few of these features. Any upcoming trips? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I'm going to uh, Maputo, Mozambique in, on uh, May 11th. Uh, we're working with a newspaper there called Verdadi, um, which uh, is working on covering uh, the local elections, well, the, the elections that are coming up in October, but we're working right now to help set up a network of live blogs to actually provide real-time coverage of a very crucial phase in, the, in those elections, which is the registration of voters. Um, and so uh, that's one of the, vis the trips that I'm going to be going on. Um, another one will be to Dakar, Senegal in June uh, to work with uh, a couple of organizations there, but mainly uh, to visit our friends and colleagues at West Africa Democracy Radio, uh, which is a radio network that we've been working with for a couple of years on providing a, a rather innovative uh, platform for digital distribution, um, both using satellite, but also leveraging the SoundCloud platform um, for getting their, their news out. Um, w along with WADR, we won the night, uh, was the Knight Batten Awards for Innovations in Journalism in 2011. We were runners up uh, along, well, Storify won, and big ups to Storify there. Uh, but the two runners up were Andy Carvin of National Public Radio and then ourselves. Awesome. Um, so, so we're in pretty good company there, um, you know, with, uh, with WADR. And so we're going to be going there to refresh their site and to refresh their uh, uh, their platform and add some new stuff there. Um, and then uh, later in the year, I think uh, another another big trip that we'll have is to actually discuss some things with some uh, partners in the United States so that we're really providing a bridge between developed, uh, developed countries and developing countries. And so, you know, this is one of the things that Source Fabric is really uh, emphasizing, that a newsroom is a newsroom, whether it's in Basel or Bamako. Uh, or Berlin, or uh, you know any other town that starts with a B. Um, <laughs> so for us, you know, for us that's really you know the important thing. I mean, a newsroom works exactly the same uh, wherever you are. You have editors, you have reporters, you have news. What happens to that news? Uh, you know, how does it get uh, get formatted? How does it get distributed? Um, all of those things are exactly the same everywhere you go in the world. And so this is something that we really think is, is crucial um, and is something that can be leveraged so that we can share innovations wherever they occur in the world. So don't you believe that the kind of journalism that we've seen until today is actually going to change and evolve somehow? Uh, absolutely, but I mean, you know, there is nothing better than good old-fashioned shoe leather. Uh, there's nothing that will replace an investigative reporter. Now, that, that investi an investigative reporter might be using data. Uh, they might be using mobile technology to actually report from the field. Um, you know, the tools and the methods may change, but, you know, humans are humans, and our curiosity really is the most important thing there. Tell me how this story happened. Tell me what the story is. Um, why is this important to me? Um, all of those questions will remain. And you know, while we may actually use this tool or that tool to tell the story, the stories will essentially be the same kinds of stories that they've always been. You know, uh, what you know, like we've seen with the uh, the offshore uh, uh, banking that uh, you know the in International Center for Investigative Journalism uncovered. Right? You know, that's those those types of stories are. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't changed since the 1890s. Um, you know the the you know the types of things that uh, you know that investigative reporters tend to uncover 
they have not, not really changed that much. And I suppose that they won't until we get rocket packs that are floating around the sky, you know, in flying cars and things. But even then, we're still going to be, be covering the same, same types of things because humans haven't evolved. And that was very minority reporty-ish. <laughs> Exactly. Well, you asked me to talk about the future. Yes, okay. well, yeah. <laughs> All right, then, Douglas, I thank you so much for your time. Very happy to talk to you. <laughs>